please welcome Pierre Lam, James Ivory, and Nicholas Elliott, who will be moderating the Q&A. Good evening. I'm Nicholas Elliott, and I'm very pleased to be here with director of photography Pierre Lhomme and director James Ivory. Um, I'm going to start by asking a couple of questions that focus on the collaboration between these two gentlemen who are good friends and have worked together on four films, and then I'll open it up to the audience and we can take any questions that you have about the film we've just watched. Uh, I'll begin with a relatively simple question for you, James. Um, this was the second time that you worked with Pierre after Quartet, and also it was your, I believe, second Forster adaptation after Room with a View. Why did you choose to turn to Pierre for this particular film? <clears throat> well, there were, uh, uh, there were uh, several reasons. Um, a, a lot of people ask me, well, why don't you why don't you want to shoot the film with Tony Pierce Roberts, who just made A Room with a View? And that would have been nice, but I think he, was, he had another job, but there was a bigger reason. Uh, I thought it would be interesting to have uh, Pierre, a Frenchman, uh, let loose on all those locations and, and rooms and, and, uh, in, in England, which have been photographed and photographed and photographed forever. And I thought that he would give a new, a new look. We'd get a new feeling from a foreign cameraman, and particularly a French cameraman. There would be something there that uh, you wouldn't get otherwise. Pierre, what was it that um, appealed to you about this project? First, first of all, I was very happy to work again with, with Jim because we had a very good relation during Quartet, and uh, I, I'm going from one pleasure to one pleasure, and this, and <laughs> from one encounter to another encounter. So, t to meet Jim again was a great pleasure, and also I knew that with him we would have the best English actors as possible, and the the pleasure of a cinematographer is very. Uh, uh, depending, I mean, the, uh, on the on the actors, and I knew that I would be happy. Once you got involved with the project, how did you think? Um, how did you conceive the photography for the film? It's a for a period piece, and especially coming after Room with a View, it's it's quite somber and misty. How did how did you think about um, the image? We, we wanted that. We wanted. I, I, I told Pierre, uh, I think, uh, let's, let's do a film that's in cool colors. That was it. I mean, after Room with a View, which was Florence and Sun and, and all the colors of Italy and so forth, and I, I wanted something. And also, there, was, uh, there is that about the story and, and the lives of the, of the characters which suggests coolness and the gray clouds of an uncertain weather of England and so forth. And I thought that a darker and cooler look would be good. Pierre, how did you think about the image? Did you have certain references, whether pictures or films, or what was your approach? No, intuitions. <laughs> and uh, also when, you know, not all the directors are... Uh, have a aesthetic point of view. And Jim has a, a very visual point of view. And this is not so uh, usual now. So uh, that's it. I mean, we, we, we had an easy dialogue and uh, the relation with the script was so strong. Uh, I was discovering more than anybody else on the set, thanks to the actors also. But we had the scenario. Uh, that I was discovering a world which I really did not know. After the film, one of my cousins came to see me and said, 
I will tell you someone no one knows in my family. I am an homosexual. You know, I said, I knew this guy, he was a cousin, I knew him for a long time. So this is also part of the, uh, of the energy that you give when you shoot a film. Are there any questions from the audience at this point? Um, this can be a question for both of you. I'm wondering what one of your greatest uh, creative struggles were throughout your careers and how you overcame or accepted it. There's not just one. <laughs> there are many. Oh, it's, it's an endless question, you know. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I went spontaneously to, uh, to difficult uh, and uh, scenarios demanding uh, a lot. So uh, I was not surprised. I mean, I enjoyed that. This is part of the reason why I'm doing this uh, activity. Okay, activity. It's, it's very difficult because people would like uh, everything to be understandable and uh, we don't have known reasons to do what we do. We have a lot of one, a lot of reasons are obvious, but the most important ones, maybe we don't know them. We just, the question is to move or to, to stay alive or to uh, keep quiet. Difficult question. <laughs> James? Well, there are, always, there, there are always, what sticks out in my mind is always, of course, the things that have stopped me from doing what I wanted to do on a particular day or in a particular week, for some reason it had nothing to do with, with my thinking or my activity. I remember on this film, there was suddenly around the space of the camera a kind of mutiny. This was in England, a kind of mutiny amongst the camera systems. Um, they, they weren't happy. And they, uh, there was the focus puller and the clapper boy and all the rest. And um, uh, they weren't happy. And suddenly, on the very day that we were, had planned the big scene where Morris and Clive have a fight, um, when Clive thinks that, or when Morris thinks that uh, Clive and his sister are involved, they have a big fight. On that very day, which was a very difficult scene to do, uh, and the two actors were, you know, all prepared and had been preparing for it. The crew walked off the set, just like that. And we had to wait around many hours until we got a substitute crew. And, um, and then what did you say that I said about the king? <laughs> so I, I, I couldn't understand very well what was happening in the crew. You know, usually I have a crew and I have ex very good relation with with my partners. And in England, I was the I was alone. And uh, this this uh, did happen in in, the, in my crew, and I could not understand the reason why. And, and James told me, but Pierre, you forgot that the French people killed their king. <laughs> so. I never forgot. You know, because... <laughs> it's, it's true. I mean, he was a representative of the ancient enemy. And there he was, bossing them around. The sophisticated Frenchman. Uh, and this was just too much for these guys. And that was it. And they walked off. Uh, we have had a very ex excellent relation with the ones coming after. They were very good, yeah. <laughs> very good. <laughs> So this is the kind of thing that can happen, and it can happen on any film, and you never know what's coming. Do we have another question? The gentleman in the front row here. What are some films that have influenced you both, uh, classic and contemporary? And for Mr. Ivory, how do you like to rehearse with actors? The actors seem to be so well structured, but spontaneous in this film. We could never afford to have rehearsals. Of all of our films, there was only one that had really serious rehearsals, and that was Mr. and Mrs. Bridge. Uh, everybody was here in New York, uh, and we rented a place to have the rehearsals for uh, two weeks, and we had proper rehearsals. 
Now, those rehearsals don't have much to do with the way you actually shoot a film because the rehearsals are not on the location. You don't know what kind of a room you're going to have or doors and windows and furniture and all the rest of it, how the actors are going to move around. You don't know that until you go onto the set. So we've just never had rehearsals. Sometimes we haven't even had read-throughs. On Remains of the Day, um, Emma Thompson was making a film until the day before she came, not the day be before she started working, but the day before that. She was working on another film. We didn't even have a read-through. So that's just the way we worked. And, uh, but as I say, rehearsals, they're wonderful for getting, they're wonderful for going through the lines and deciding whether this line works or doesn't work or you want to add something or take something away. In that way, a rehearsal is good, but it's not good in terms of blocking a film or deciding how the scenes are going to be shot or anything like that. There's no, I mean, you can't just put all the people in a room and think it's anything like being on a, being on a set. Okay, a few films, but the reason why I wanted to, to be part of a, a film crew uh, was the film of Jean Vigo and the films of uh, Renoir and, uh, and many others. But those two guys are, are the men uh, uh, had the strongest influence. I did not, when I went to school to learn about the film technique, I had no idea of what I would be in a film crew. Uh, it came little by little. I was really uh, fascinated by the image and the light. But the main reason uh, was to be part of a film crew, to be a cinematographer for a scenario and a director. I really, this was what I wanted. And this is what I did. Uh, a few mistakes maybe, but not so many. You asked me about influences on me. The greatest influence on me was Satyajit Ray. Because when I came to know him, I was making a documentary in India. And he had an enormous influence I mean, he, on, on our first feature, which was The Householder. I mean, he provided the cameraman, Shabro Mitra. He provided most of his crew. He wasn't shooting a film at that time. He re-edited the film at the end. All sorts of things. In the next film, uh, he composed the music, which was Shakespeare Walla. And he, he is the person of all other directors that has stayed with me the longest. And I see his influence even today, or in the last film I made, I see it. There are moments, they would not be like that if it weren't for him. And they're not, it's not things that I'm copying him or even remembering, but I know that I have done them because of what I learned from him and his films and working with his crew. Do we have another question? I see someone up in the near back. How much liberty did you take with the script? And in choosing such beautiful men, was that a statement of, of its own? Well, you know, beautiful actors improve sort of mediocre books sometimes. <laughs> and I'm not saying Morris was a mediocre uh, novel. It wasn't. But of all of Forster's novels, it's the one that people have most criticism of. But if you, if you get... Ter terrific uh, charmers to play the parts that seem rather flat as you read them in the novel. They bring them to life. So I don't know how, about narcissistic, but uh, that is a fact that happens with any kind of movie and any kind of adaptation, I think. And this is what uh, Ivory expects from a cinematographer is to make the people as uh, their best, best look and best behavior. Well, particularly the women, no? Yeah, yeah, yes, I mean, the, the men We, we too, are unfortunately living too. in a country with a great, a great, great um, film industry, but the, most cameramen do not know how to light the women. They just don't, I'm sorry. Because they don't, if you like them, you like them in a good way. I would think, but. I saw another hand go up in the middle there. Or... You said earlier, uh, Mr. Long, that great actors are easier to make your job easier. Did you just mean that it's easier to make them look better or it helped you shoot? You know, we, you, you enjoy to work with them when they are good. 
I, if I did understand well the question. And uh, particularly when you see the actors in, in Morris, the work of those two guys before the shooting and during the shooting is, is just amazing. Uh, and they, they give you energy and, and uh, uh, they help you to uh, do your best as they are doing their best also. You know, it's like uh, to work hand in hand for the scenario. Uh, you know, it's, it's, those questions are very tricky. <laughs> there is a gentleman here with a question down uh, front. Uh, this is a question to Pierre. Um, you know, there's a bunch of wonderful films here that we're seeing, um, uh, which you've shot. And if I were just to, both for sort of audiences as well as filmmakers, and if I were to pick one film out of this lot, I would like you to talk about working with Jean-Pierre Melville and the style that you had in Army of Shadows, which is one of the most extraordinary films I have seen several times over, and especially in its restoration, which is uh, completely extraordinary too. Um, so if you could speak about that. Working with Melville and the style. You know, the, this, let us say that it's approximately 50 years ago so that you will notice that little by little, we change our memories. I, when I did the restoration of the film five or six years ago, I was a, a, a good spectator. I was, I, I was a free of, of the, all those, the so difficult uh, remembrance I had of the shooting. The shooting was a terrible uh, épreuve. Uh, trial. Trial. Every day. Every day. So that you were not, I was not uh, uh, aware of the quality of the film we were shooting. I had too many problems. It was too difficult. It was a daily challenge. But when I restored the film, all those memories were gone and I was a new uh, spectator. And I discovered that it was the, the, the best cinematography I had seen for a long time. And very close to Bresson, which looks very awkward when you say that, because Bresson rejects the, the actors and the many things. But the, the simplicity, the purity of the, of the, of the shooting remains in, with Bresson, it remains with Melville. Uh, it's a long story, you know, with that uh, uh, when you have a daily uh, daily challenge and not in a very nice uh, 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 mood. I mean, the Melville was a very, uh, uh, I don't know, a very tough person, very tough person, not gentle at all, and enjoying conflict, enjoying conflict. If things were going well, he would get mad, you know, and, and uh, he would also reject the, the light and the sun. He would be like a, 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 an owl. Yeah. Okay, so, you know, I could, I could speak for, I mean, it's just like with Jim, it's the strong personality, so different. And it's so, this question, I did not solve it yet, and so I w it means that I shall never know what is the, uh, the ability of a cinematographer to go from one director to another one so different and to enjoy it. To me, it's a mystery. If you can solve it, do it. <laughs> we have time for just a couple more questions. Uh, it was published posthumously. And he, he was very reticent to, uh, to publish during his lifetime because it, it, it committed him, he would have to commit himself to being homosexual because all the other plots of his uh, novels don't take up that subject matter. The reason that it wasn't published during his lifetime is that it would have been, he would have been, uh, 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 it would have been considered obscenity 
Yes, it would, yes. And, and the British had very strong laws about that kind of thing until uh, I think oh, I the middle 1960s or something. Uh -huh. So he could never have published it in his lifetime. Earlier on, he didn't want to publish it because he, he was afraid of what his mother might say. And, um, yeah, and he didn't but, want but that it, that so. was not the real reason. It was also that he 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 could have been tried for obscenity in the same period when he didn't write any novels. It was a long, long time, forty years or something. He wrote a great number, not a great, at least a dozen short stories with a homosexual theme. Oh. And it wasn't that he he wasn't going to commit himself or something like that, but he just could not take take the risk of being taken into court, you know, like Lady right. Chatterley's lover or something like that. Yeah. He wasn't, didn't want to do it. But thank you for that note. We'll take a last question uh, now. I see a gentleman right here. So my question is one of interpretation. Um, and the, something I think is really interesting about the film is that I turned to my friend um, after it was over and I, I said, oh, I can't believe that ending, it seems so happy to me. And he responded, oh, I thought it was really ambiguous. And I wondered, uh, and maybe you can speak to this, what was your intention with that final scene of Scudder and Maurice embracing? Because it, to me, it seemed like they were finding love, even though Scudder might be the worst human being alive. Um, and, but is it that, or is it something more complicated? It is, it's uh, a little complicated. Um, Forster said and wrote that he wanted to write a novel that had a, a, an homosexual love that had a happy ending. Nobody else ever had. It's just like there are no other films that ever that you, that you see, wonderful as they may be, that seem to have a happy ending. People are always, always punished or they die or whatever it is. And he wanted to have a happy ending. But the next thing is, well, what would that ending have been? Because he was ready to give up his job. He would really have had to go into a kind of hiding in a way. Uh, and live outside society, and um, so it wasn't it, it wasn't ambiguous. Um, well, it, you, you didn't know what was going to happen to them, but at least at that moment they were happy. Then that's what Forster wanted. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, all of you, for staying, and thank you to Pierre Lhomme and James Ivory.